Some of you might understand that nutrition is about good feeding. You're partly right. However, it's more than that. How about a listen to Naziri Angela's story, who had no idea on her malnourished son until an elderly noticed. She shared her story during the National Nutrition Dialogue 2022 at Sheraton Hotel. Uh, well, the year was 2017 and my boy was only nine months old. And back then I was serving in the bank. My employer was in the banking industry. And, um, well, this is emotional. You pardon me when you see me go quiet because it brings back very hurtful memories. Well, it was one Saturday afternoon. I was going home and, you know, one of the lady vendors by the roadside, you know, she humbly asked, Nyabo, mama omwanoli, loosely translated, are you the mother of the other boy? Of course, she gave me a brief description, you know. My child minder would, you know, occasionally go out with my boy to take walks and all that. And then, she said, Omana wo weta go kumutu wala mudua ilo kubata libulonji. Loosely translated, she said, you need to take your child to the hospital because he is not well. You know, I stood and then, you know, I absent-mindedly just walked away because I was wondering, I mean, where does she get the gas to say that to me? I've not seen anything wrong with my child. But you know, she was an elderly woman and she only knew better. She knew what she was talking about. At least I didn't know, you know. So um, why was it weird that she would say my boy was sick? Because, you know, my boy was chubby, you know, that pseudo chubbiness. You know, he was growing fat and I thought he was being fed well. But then, you know what, I decided to say, okay, let me go and check on this boy. So when I reached home, my child minder quickly said, Mommy, Oma no na zin baby get it. Simani chizi, which you know, loosely translated, that the child keeps, you know, getting big feet and she didn't know what the cause was. So I decided to go to a hospital, you know. I went to Keserena Children's Hospital in Bokoto. You know, it was an evening. So I sat there as the doctors tried to examine my child and I could tell from the pacing up and down, you know, something wasn't right. And then the lady, she was so sweet and then she told me, you know what, we cannot manage your situation here and I'm going to send you to Mwana Mujimu. So she booked me in, you know, she made an advance call and you know, I almost got dizzy. Things were moving so fast. I'm like, now what's the problem? If guys, if they are referring me to a, a national hospital, it must be serious. So um, I went home, I packed my boys' bags, and then I went to Mulago Hospital. The first time I've been to Mulago is when I was having my first child. That's the only experience I had until I had to walk through the doors of Mwanamujimu Nutrition Clinic. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the biggest shame, you know, I was um, well-groomed, you know. I was a respectable young corporate, but then you're carrying a child that is malnourished. You know, all the doctors could not believe it. You know, some ridiculed me. You know, all that got to me because they could not believe that I could look the way I looked, but my child was wasting away. So, um, I went to the acute unit and when the doctors examined my boy, I was told he had um, edema. And I think uh, they told me the reason was he had a deficiency of protein in his diet. So he was retaining water in his body. That's why he was growing fat. And I thought my child was healthy. And you know, with my work routine, I would leave home at 5 a.m., come back close to midnight, 
you know, and I would not have an opportunity to see my baby. And I thought all was well, but little did I know because from the onset my boy could not breastfeed. He refused to breastfeed, so he had an intolerance for milk. So he would not take milk, and the child minder was not alerting me about this. So he kept taking carbohydrate, you know that brown porridge of cedar. He kept taking that without milk, and you know, I, I had no idea. You know, I cannot stop blaming myself. So he had fluid retention in his body because he lacked protein in his diet, and that's why he was all swelling up. But then I started noticing his skin color was changing. It was turning into yellow. He had scanty hair. So all that was um, revealed to me when I was at Mwanamujimu. So I had to be admitted. I was admitted for three weeks at the facility. But the doctors, you know, gave me some pep talk. You know, they say, if you want to leave this establishment real quick, You've got to humble yourself and accept to learn. That was the hardest thing, my people. It was the hardest thing, you know. You're looking at the mothers that are there, and then you're looking at yourself. There's a disconnect. These are people that cannot afford all the three meals we are talking about. You know, it kind of belittled me. It humbled me. Those three weeks in Mwana Mujimo humbled me. And I cannot emphasize it enough. And I don't know, I cannot, I cannot really tell you for you to understand what I was going through. Because one, I could not breastfeed my boy. He could not be fed on a bottle. You know, they had to give him 75 meals of that special milk they give. Imagine a child is crying. You can't breastfeed because I wasn't breastfeeding. You can't feed him on milk. You know, they're injecting him all the time, you know, trying to feed him. It was very absurd. So, and then, after the three weeks, the doctor sat me down. And they told me, you can go back and work, and then you'll lose your child. Because the risk was, he was going to be stunted then his motor skills would be affected. So the lady told me, you have a choice. You can go back to your banking job and see your child waste, or you can sacrifice and take care of your child. Ladies and gentlemen, that felt like a million mile journey to the moon and back. James Muonge, Assistant Director for Methodology and Statistical Coordination Services at UBOS, expresses that the data collected by their team is useful in the implementation process. Uh, as a bureau, our work is to ensure that we provide the information that supports decision making at all levels. To provide the evidence. Now, in specifically on nutrition, we have a number of surveys where we do, we collect information on nutrition. And so, as I said, this is annual. This is an annual panel survey. So we have some of the information we collect on an annual basis. Now, every five years, we, have, we run a demographic and health survey, which we also collect. And, uh, you know, we are also able to provide information on, on the nutrition status. So next year, we shall have information on that. So the, our, the idea is we have, to, we have to be able to see, to see how far have we moved, what is the, how, have we improved, or we have remained static. Now, the information we get, once we come like in this forum, now the implementers, okay, those who are supposed to make decisions, and those who are supposed to actually work with the communities to improve nutrition. Now use this information to identify areas where they have to go and say if this area has a, a high starting levels, what is it? What's not working out? And so it's the policy makers, it's the members of the party, those who make decisions, it's the, the ministries responsible, because nutrition covers many areas. It's education, it's health, it is agriculture, it is Ministry of Gender, 
this works, this uh, water and sanitation, there are quite a number. Now, when they come together and we dialogue and discuss, they will be able to guide and find solutions to this. So we, we collect information, but collect it regularly, and then engage them and disseminate this information. That is so interesting. Thank you so much. How are you working with the communities, local communities, to gather this information? Okay, for, for us as a bureau, we, we don't directly deal with the communities, but we go to the communities to collect the information because if government offers services to the communities, so we go there to find out whether the extent to which these, they are enjoying the services or they are consuming the services. So if there are nutritional programs, then we ask about the aspects of nutrition. So if they tell us that they are not benefiting or they are improving, that's what we bring back to the people who, who, who actually deliver the services. Because as you know, the local governments are at the center of service delivery, and the ministries work with the local governments. And for us, we collect information from, these, from the households in these local governments. So since we collect it from across the country, now whatever picture we get is representative at those levels. So directly we don't work with the households, but we go there to collect information because they are the beneficiaries. All programs target the, the household. The children live in the households. So you need to know what happens to the child, you need to know what happens to the, the people in the household if you are to improve service delivery. So our role is to make sure that we collect the information that will support Implement implementation. During implementation, there is a model followed by policy makers, according to Nasali Amina, a policy analyst from the office of the Prime Minister. So being OPM, or under the project still it's still a model, we shall have to engage the different stakeholders. For example, it could be that schools cannot afford to provide a meal, or parents do not afford, or government has not supported in this way or that way. So we have to engage the different stakeholders. It could be ministries, they could be agencies, bring them on board. And then we see how we can help come up with a, an, uh, an everlasting solution. And that is primarily the role of OPM. Because being that we coordinate different businesses of government, we are the lead of government business, we have to bring the different stakeholders on board, talk about the issue and find remedies that are supposed to be a solution to that problem that is identified. So basically that's how the NIPN model is. Okay. Yeah. So being OPM, or under the project still it's still a model, we shall have to engage the different stakeholders. For example, it could be that schools cannot afford to provide a meal, or parents do not afford, or government has not supported in this way or that way. So we have to engage the different stakeholders. It could be ministries, they could be agencies, bring them on board. And then we see how we can help come up with a, an, uh, an everlasting solution. And that is primarily the role of OPM. Because being that we coordinate different businesses of government, we are the lead of government business, we have to bring the different stakeholders on board, talk about the issue and find remedies that are supposed to be a solution to that problem that is identified. So basically that's how the NIPN model is. Okay. Yeah. The story that has touched so many, she's going to basically, I know some of you are going through the same, but she's here to let you know that it's not the end of the world. You can still take care of your child, you move on with life, and things are really never permanent. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Let us kickstart it with mothers who are watching you, single fathers out there who are uh, undergoing some circumstance of having um, a malnourished child or children with nutrition uh, challenges. What do you have to tell them in, in the moment they're going through? Okay, for one, malnutrition can be avoided, it can be beaten, all hope is not lost, especially when you get to know quickly. You know, people are living in denial. That's one challenge. 
especially people in the corporate world, they do not want to accept because they find it, they feel it's um, an embarrassing situation. And I felt like that for a few weeks back then because, you know, they look at you and there's a disconnect between how you look and how your child looks. Because a malnourished child doesn't really look nice, yeah? But my advice, especially, you mentioned something to do with um, single fathers. And for them, it's really tasking because they don't know much about parenthood. They cannot breastfeed, obviously. They'll resort to bottle feeding, bottle feeding which is discouraged because I experienced that, you know, when I was in Mwanamjimu. They don't encourage you to use bottle feeds. So if you can't breastfeed, it becomes tough. How do you supplement, you know? feeding for that child my advice if you feel there is something wrong with your child if you cannot walk to a hospital talk to people who have children you know people that are older than you talk to them tell them I feel there is a problem here they'll be able to help you know and you know let's do away with uh, superstition of you know someone is bewitching me someone is against me Let's put all that behind us because we live in a civilized world. But I would most definitely recommend going to a health facility. Because if I hadn't gone to hospital when I did, actually the, the PID told me if you hadn't come at the time you did, you were going to have severe complications that would have been irreversible. So I would highly encourage that people go to a health facility when you feel something is amiss with your child. You know, especially when you compare their age and the way they are growing, you know, some children are really short compared to their age. You can look at their skin texture, you can look at their eyes, how do they respond to food, you know, all that stuff is critical. And then to our stakeholders, um, to employers, to government, if at all, you know, there is a six-month grace period during maternity, you know, that debate came. But I think not all employers have taken it up. I would highly encourage, it could even be a year, honestly. Six months is not enough. A year. Yes, because right now we are living in a new normal where people are working from home. So if your job does not really require you to be at your workstation, you can stay and work from home while you take care of your child. If not, like I had mentioned earlier, you can, you know, put up a certain arrangement. Maybe that mother, new mother can come in late, probably at 11, do some work, then leave early, you know, so that they give. You know, every minute you lose with a child, you'll never get back. And, you know, you'll never stop blaming yourself because, you know, there are risks of stunted growth. There are risks of mental retardation. You know, retardation, your child is not performing well in school, and then you keep accusing your neighbor, your, the co-wife, you know, you know all those stories that come with it, you know. But it's simply how the child fed when they were still babies. That, you know, sensitive stage in life is really important. And what kind of food do we give to our children? In my case, my child lacked protein in his diet. And little did I know that my child was not taking milk. Something as basic as milk, which you can get, you know, a cup at 500 or 600 shillings. Mm. You know, that is what it took for my child to get into that state. So, there isn't much to say. You know, the technocrats know better. But in the end, there is a happy ending. Yes, Tell us how is. the boy is doing now. Yes. The boy is good, you know. He's Amsterdam, by the way. He's going to turn six in November. He's always on top of his class. Mm -hmm. His cognitive skills are amazing. Mm -hmm. His motor skills are amazing. Mm -hmm. He's a very interactive boy. You know, sometimes I look back and can say I made the right decision at the end of it all. It might be tough right now, but I made the right decision because you cannot replace a child, honestly. You cannot. It's not like a broken marriage where you get to marry somebody else. <laughs> when you lose a child, you, you will never forgive yourself. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Like I said, it's not the end of the world. There is always a happy ending, but it comes with a sacrifice. As a policy analyst, we have heard so many complaints from new mothers, how even she mentioned the three months are really not, um, they are not friendly to the new mothers or to the mothers who have just given birth. I mean, is that something you're working on to change uh, 
a father, coming father for, you know, mothers working. What can you share with us from that perspective? What can we raise hopes on as mothers? Um, I'm also a mother who has suffered the same challenges. You know, you leave your baby home when they're just three months, four months, you have to come back to work. But we really think uh, the best thing would be if there would be provisions like a mother coming with their kid to office, give them breastfeeding areas. For example, I had it, one was introduced for the parliamentarians. I wish that could be, you know, extended to all the other working mothers. Or government would also think of um, maybe increasing maternity leave, probably from the three months to six, because at least the exclusive breastfeeding is done by then. So those are all thoughts, and uh, I believe the Ministry of Health could be thinking of something better. But those are the options that we have, and I've had the discussions about them, and we believe something might mature from them. Thank you so much. I pray something happens in yeah. that decision making. A number of partners have ensured that national nutrition is a success across the country. Uh, yes, government is funding, but as I said, there are many development partners supporting. The European Union has been supporting the analysis to make sure that the data that exists is in, in areas of nutrition reaches the users because some data exists but people, many users don't know that it exists. So being able to collect as much information wherever it is and share it out. But also we have USID through the Center for Disease Control. We've been working together to make sure that the, you know, we get the ingredients that we need to be able to measure nutrition properly. UNICEF has also been a key partner. And so we, OPM as government and ourselves, we work together. So it has been a partnership and it's working well. Thank you so much. I know it's not stopping here. What can uh, someone watching you expect in their def designated areas? I mean, are there specified districts or regions you go to or across the region? What levels? No, we, we, for, for us when we are collecting information, we go everywhere. We cover the, all the districts in Uganda. Okay. Yeah, we cover. But uh, to me, what I would appeal to, to, to our parents, our relatives out there, is that nutrition starts from us. Okay? You don't, it's not about money, but it is even the, the vegetables we grow, the fish, even the small fish, silver fish, those small things. The issue is, do you eat them in the adequate amounts? So it may not be only a step of foods, but eating greens is not a, a curse. Or taking some fresh beans is not a problem. But the issue is, it shouldn't be one item only. We need, let's try to diversify within the means that we can afford. Because I know we may not have the money to buy the best, but even what you have, let's try to make sure that we balance it, we diversify, especially for the children below five years because if they miss out there there are certain things they may never recover from thank you thank you better nutrition is important in the achievement of prosperity for communities and the nation at large nutrition is core to the human capital development program of the national development plan three mm -hmm.